and this has not really changed even with all of our new medications. And so there've been a lot of questions, why is that? Do we need different models to study epilepsy? Do we need to identify different mechanisms of action? And we do know that in addition to our anti-seizure medications, we do have other alternative therapies such as dietary therapy, which I am a zealot about, the stimulators, as well as the very important role of epilepsy surgery. But with that unmet need, uh, today I'd like to make the case for cannabidiol. Uh, and first we'll review, and I think very humbling actually, that this is not a new idea. Uh, so what can history teach us about a possible role of cannabidiol in treating epilepsy? Uh, then we'll look at the possible mechanisms mechanism of action uh, and could they make sense? We'll look briefly at what the preclinical studies suggest about a possible role for cannabidiol in the treatment of epilepsy, and then turn to the clinical data. And then finally, uh, what more do we really need to know? So as I said, it was very humbling to me uh, when I realized that this was not new, this interest in medical marijuana or cannabis in treating epilepsy. In fact, it's been discussed for thousands of years um, with the first report in 2200 BCE in Samaria and, the, and stone text uh, was the first documented use of epilepsy. And there were other references uh, earlier. In the 1800s, there was actually a lot of interest in the role of cannabis in the treatment of epilepsy. And in 1842, O'Shaughnessy reported that cannabis reduced infantile convulsions as well as other disorders. Pointing out importantly, especially from my view as a pediatric epileptologist, that it could be effective not only in seizures, but in treating infantile convulsions. And then in 1856, McMeans reported the successful use of a tincture of cannabis indica in four children with epilepsy, including a seven week old female. Again, could be effective in children, including very young children. The reference I was really um, had glad to find was in 1881 when William Gowers, who we all know well, um, reported cannabis had been recommended for epilepsy by Russell Reynolds in 1861 as sometimes though not very frequently useful a small value as an adjunct to the bromide, but is sometimes of considerable service given separately. And Gowers himself actually administered cannabis in many cases. Um, and he saw that it sometimes delayed the paroxysm as well as mitigated the severity in some individuals. So lots of interest, both in the clinical world, many medical reports um, leading to an 1851 in the US dispensary Cannabis compounds were actually suggested for several disorders, including convulsive disorders. And in 1860, the State of Ohio Medical Society Committee on Cannabis Indica claimed efficacy for infantile convulsions, epilepsy, as well as many other disorders. So growing interest, growing use, growing mentions in the medical literature. Uh, and then things changed dramatically uh, when in 1911, uh, Massachusetts, and I was very disappointed to learn it was my very blue state of Massachusetts, uh, was the first state in the United States to outlaw cannabis. And this occurred in the setting of prohibition of alcohol. And the other states very quickly followed with marijuana prohibition laws. And things got even worse in 1970 with the US Controlled Substance Act, um, which classed marijuana as a drug with no acceptable medical use. Uh, so really kind of ignoring the reports, um, earlier reports, and this made understanding a possible role for cannabis and chemicals in cannabis and medical therapy, as well as understanding the basic science of cannabis, um, almost impossible. Then, as you all know, things really started changing in the 1990s um, with the availability of medical marijuana. And California was the first state in the United States to legalize medical marijuana. Uh, and by 2015, this was really amazing to me, and I think really shows the power of the patient community, which was largely driving this. But by 2015, medical marijuana was legalized in 23 states in the United States. Um, it's regulated at the state level by the state DEA. Uh, and in addition, CBD or cannabidiol was specifically made legal in an additional 16 states. And during this time, there were increasing anecdotal reports about the efficacy of medical marijuana especially cannabidiol enriched formulations in the treatment of refractory pediatric epilepsy. So what about medical marijuana? Uh, as you know, cannabis for marijuana is two main strains, indica and sativa. Uh, and cannabis is a pretty, pretty interesting plant. It actually contains over 500 chemical compounds, uh, including cannabinoids. And the cannabinoids are a family of 
over 120 chemical compounds that are unique to the cannabis plant. Uh, so these are phytocannabinoids because they're derived from the plant and cannabis is the only plant species that contains cannabinoids. Of the cannabinoids, cannabidiol or CBD and THC are the two most abundant and the two that had been best characterized. We know that THC is the, is the cannabinoid that produces the psychoactive effects of cannabis, produces a high. And cannabidiol also is known to not have any psychoactive effects. In addition to these two, there are many others um, that are being characterized and we don't yet know what, if any, role they'll have in treating different medical illnesses, uh, but including CBDV, THCA, et cetera. And there has been a lot of interest, especially with these early reports of the possible medical benefits of cannabis is what is the possible relationship to the endocannabinoid system uh, that we'll look at in a little more detail in a minute. And medical marijuana um, is ex are contained extracts of cannabis or more frequently the hemp plant. And these extracts may be enriched in CBD, THC, et cetera, um, but they all contain the other chemical compounds of the plant. So in the United States for the past several years, some of the popular forms or brands have been Charlotte's Web, Realm of Caring, Haley's Hope, Palmetto Harmony, uh, and many others, particularly as state dispensaries have been opening across the country. Um, but it's very important to know that these different formulations are not regulated. Uh, and therefore the, the composition of them may not be consistent and may not be exactly as labeled. What we're gonna be talking mainly about today is a different form of cannabidiol, a biologic derivative. And this is the formulation that is now FDA and EMA approved. Uh, and this is CBD purified from cannabis, a 99% pure formulation that is formulated in sesame oil with a concentration of 100 milligrams per milliliter. Uh, and this is manufactured according to the FDA uh, good manufacturing principles. In addition to these formulations of medical marijuana, there are also synthetic CBD as well as transdermal CBD formulations, which have been in some studies. So cannabidiol then, again, going back to the phytocannabinoids compared to the endocannabinoids. Uh, and as you know, the endocannabinoid is a very important signaling system uh, in our brains. Uh, and as we said, cannabis is the only plant species that has cannabinoids, again, a variety of different cannabinoids. Uh, and the endocannabinoid system, which has increasingly been researched and the importance of it increasingly appreciated, uh, we know that the endocannabinoid receptor family has two main receptors, CB1 and CB2, uh, with CB1 being the most abundant. And we know that these are G-protein coupled transmembrane receptors that are known to activate voltage-gated calcium channels and also enhance potassium channel conduction presynaptically. In addition, we also have endocannabinoids chemicals in our brains, uh, 2-AG and anandamide. And these are endogenous lipid signaling molecules and they're generated at the cell membrane from phospholipid precursors and they are known to modulate neuronal excitability. So, you know, obviously first question was, well, gee, is that how CBD could work to help epilepsy by modulating the endocannabinoid system? Is there evidence that that could be true? Um, so lower levels of anandamide, one of the endocannabinoids has been seen in CSF of patients with newly diagnosed temporal lobe epilepsy. And also tissue resected during epilepsy surgery was found to have lower levels of CB1 messenger RNA, as well as reduced expression of the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of 2-AG. But a lot of work now has been done, and I think pretty consistently and convincingly has shown that cannabidiol does not exert its main neural effects through the activation of CB1 R receptors, uh, but instead may actually function as an indirect antagonist at high levels. It is thought that interaction of THC with the CB1 receptor is what leads to the psychoactive high um, of marijuana or cannabis. So what could be the possible mechanisms of action? And there've been several hypotheses and this is a very active area of research. Um, and I think the leading, uh, the leading candidate right now is GPR55, uh, which is a G protein receptor um, and that CBD may function as an antagonist at this receptor. There's also pretty good evidence that CBD decreases presynaptic release of glutamate uh, and does so by binding to members of the TRIP family of cation channels. But there's also some evidence preclinically that it may activate serotonin 1A receptors. 
Uh, it may inhibit adenosine reuptake. There may be anti-inflammatory um, properties, may function as an antioxidant. And there's also some preclinical work that it may also modulate the mTOR pathway. So again, very active area um, of basic science research. And looking now at the preclinical, what have animal models shown about the possible role of CBD in treating epilepsy? Um, actually, it's been shown to be effective in several of our, our acute seizure models, including PTZ, MES-induced seizures, pilocarpine-induced temporal lobe seizures, as well as penicillin-induced partial seizures. The data was less convincing in chronic seizure models, which is not unlike levetiracetam. Uh, and CBD was also shown to increase the after discharge threshold, as well as reduce the after discharge amplitude, duration, and propagation in electrically kindled limbic seizures in rats. So should it be used for the treatment of medically refractory epilepsy? Well, I think as we all also know, um, all of the efficacy data until recently has been anecdotal or open label, and there really was a need for randomized controlled um, trial data. And I think importantly, and things we talk about with our patients and my colleagues all the time is that cannabidiol is not medical marijuana. Um, we know from the different formulations of medical marijuana available that there's significant variability and the artisanal medical marijuana preparations. Um, we also know those other five, greater than 500 chemicals in cannabis, um, could some of them um, or some combination be more effective? There are many people that believe in an entourage effect that CBD plus could be more effective than CBD alone, uh, but perhaps they could be also more toxic. Uh, so there really had been a need for a reproducible vetted um, CBD. So the rest of the time, I'm really gonna focus on the purified cannabidiol biologic derivative, the form that has now been FDA approved and approved in the EMA. Uh, and this was a really uh, interesting story. Uh, and this all started with an expanded access program. So about eight years ago uh, in the United States, many people very, very interested in medical marijuana and getting access to it for their children, largely children with refractory epilepsy. Uh, we had patients moving to Colorado since that was available. Uh, and so five of us, uh, five academic sites got together uh, with representatives from GW Pharma in about 2013 um, to talk about, we were hearing these anecdotal stories and I think that we felt that we had a responsibility to prove um, if this was not only of an effective treatment for our patients, but safe and well tolerated. Uh, so that led to the expanded access program uh, when each site initially asked the FDA and DEA permission to put 25 patients um, all highly refractory, our most highly refractory patients on CBD. Uh, and in order to do so, we actually wrote little biographies of each of the 25 patients for the DEA, telling about how many patients, how many, the reason for the child's or the patient's epilepsy, how many treatments they'd been on, meant most had been on numerous anti-seizure medications, many had had epilepsy surgery, many had the VNS, many had been on diet, but all of them continued to have fairly frequent refractory seizures. Uh, the program then expanded, so we enrolled a total of 61 at the MGH, and our initial 25 started in April of 2014. So we have now had children on this medication uh, for over seven years. The program then expanded uh, and, and ended up enrolling over 1,000 patients, uh, but this is a paper that looked at our early experience in the open um, expanded access program, uh, looking at 24 patients ages 1 to 30 that had been on at least 12 weeks this purified CBD. It, again, this is to determine the safety and tolerability as well as the efficacy uh, and involved at this report 11 pediatric epilepsy centers. Again, this was a compassionate use, open label. Uh, so this was not a controlled trial, no placebo data. And as I said, all of these patients had significantly medically refractory epilepsy. Although it was open label and compassionate use, we did use a shared trial design so we'd be able to pool data and look at a bigger N. Uh, so patients were started at a 2.5 to 5 milligram per kilogram per day dose which was increased weekly to a total of 25 milligrams per kilogram per day or subsequently 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. There was a four week baseline uh, during which patients and families kept detailed seizure diaries. And during that baseline, patients had to have a minimum of four seizures. And as with the clinical trial, all other medications, diet and VNS settings were stable for the month prior to enrollment. 
what we saw in this experience is that there were adverse events in about 78% of patients. Uh, the major ones or most frequent ones are also the ones seen in all of the trials. Somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, fatigue, and convulsions. And there were serious adverse events in 20%, the status epilepticus being the most common, as well as diarrhea and weight loss. Uh, and 3% did discontinue treatment due to these adverse events. Looking at efficacy, we did see, again, open label data, but we did see that it was efficacious with about close to 40% median reduction of motor seizures over the 12-week period, somewhat higher efficacy in the Dravet patients, including five patients who were seizure-free of all motor seizures. Uh, we also saw that there is a great there is a reduction uh, that were that 39% were responders, having a greater than 50% reduction in uh, motor seizures, uh, and several in the group having even better efficacy. And then we also saw that many of the patients had a significant reduction in atonic seizures. So kind of leading from that expanded access experience, as you know, then there were several randomized controlled trials, including two in Dravet syndrome, um, both of which are published, two from lennox gastaut syndrome, both of which are published, uh, and then the tuberous sclerosis complex um, trial, which was also recently published. And we're gonna look briefly at these um, all the trials had a fairly similar trial design. For both the Dravet and the lennox gastaut trials, one trial had, one of the trials for each had two arms, placebo arm and a 20 milligram per kilogram CBD. And the other trial had three arms, placebo, lower dose, 10 milligram per kilogram per day, and 20 milligram per kilogram per day or higher dose. So we'll just look quickly at one each of these trials. Um, Again, to remind everyone that Dravet syndrome is a severe infantile onset, highly treatment resistant epilepsy that is due in the majority of cases to a mutation in the SCN1A sodium channel. Uh, onset is first year of life and previously healthy infants typically develop multiple types of seizures uh, and severe intellectual disability. And then Linus Gastaut syndrome, as we know, is also very highly treatment resistant epilepsy, peak onset between three and five years of age. Uh, with multiple etiologies. Uh, and these kids typically develop multiple seizure types, including drop seizures, tonic seizures, and most have some degree of intellectual disability, well, which is often severe. So first looking at the um, first Dravet syndrome trial, uh, and this is the one that I, our group was involved with. Uh, and this trial enrolled 120 patients with Dravet syndrome with a mean, median age of 9.2 years. So the Dravet trials were both largely pediatric, going up to 18 years of age. Uh, this trial was fairly equally split, split between genders. Uh, and these patients had refractory epilepsy, having been on numerous prior AEDs and on an average of 2.9 concomitant AEDs when they enrolled. And in this trial, patients were randomized after the baseline period, either to placebo or to that higher 20 milligram per kilogram per day dose. And the primary endpoint of the trial was the change in convulsive seizure frequency over a 14 week treatment period compared to the four week baseline. So the design of this trial was after the baseline if patients met criteria for enrollment, there was a two, two week titration and then a 12 week maintenance. And so the primary endpoint was a 14 week treatment. So including the titration period as well as the maintenance period. And this study achieved all of its endpoints. So it achieved the primary endpoint uh, with the CBD arm showing a close to 40% mean, median reduction of seizures compared to placebo with an adjusted mean difference of 22.8%. Um, it also met all of its secondary endpoints. Um, looking at the responder rate or the, those with the greater than 50% reduction in convulsive seizures, CBD was 43% versus placebo 27%. Also met the endpoint looking at the caregiver global impression of change scale. Uh, with those in the CBD arm, 62 reporting improvement in greater than one category versus 34% in the placebo arm. And it also reached the secondary endpoint of seizure freedom during the treatment period with the CBD, 5% of those showing seizure freedom versus none or zero in placebo arm. The adverse events were more common in the CBD group, although we're also seen in the placebo group as would be expected. And the most frequent, again, consistent through the trials, diarrhea, vomiting, fatigue, pyrexia, somnolence, uh, as well as abnormal results on liver function tests. So going from the Dravet to the, to the um, LGS trial, and again, this was the one that our group was involved in. 
uh, this trial uh, in, enrolled importantly um, children and adults with LGS, enrolling patients up to the age of 55 years, had the clinical diagnosis of LGS inadequately controlled by anti-seizure medications and a history of slow spike and wave pattern on EEG. And I will say that for all of these trials, the Epilepsy Consortium uh, was involved in validating that uh, patient recruitment. And the patients had to have at least two drop seizures uh, each week during the 28 week baseline period. And this trial also was the two arm trial. Uh, so the treatment groups were the 20 milligram per kilogram uh, per day of CBD versus placebo in addition to the concomitant anti-seizure medications. And this trial, again, patients started at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per day and titrated up to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day over 12, two weeks, followed by that same 12 week dose maintenance period. And the primary endpoint of this trial was percentage change from baseline in drop seizures over the 14 week treatment period. This looks at the demographics and as you can see, they've fairly evenly split between the treatment and placebo arm. And importantly in this trial again, is that um, in both arms, about a third of patients were adults in that 18 to 55 year range. As with the DuVay trial, um, similar split between gender, patients had refractory epilepsy having been on many seizure medications. Uh, and these patients also had a, quite a range, but several of them had quite a few um, seizures during the baseline period. And looking at the primary endpoint for this, as you can see, both for the drop seizures, which was the primary endpoint, as well as the non-drop seizures, um, the CBD arm was statistically significant, led to a statistically significant greater reduction in seizures uh, than the placebo arm. And on the subject of caregiver global impression of change, you can see that the CBD uh, caregivers' patients were significantly more likely to report an improvement in the patient condition uh, than the placebo arm. Safety results here, again, there were adverse events, both in the CBD and placebo arm, more in the treatment group. And again, the ones that were seen most frequently, diarrhea, somnolence, pyrexia, decreased appetite, and vomiting. Uh, increases in liver transaminases occurred in one placebo and 20 CBD patients, the majority of whom were on concomitant valproic acid. And importantly, none of these patients met standard criteria for drug-induced liver uh, injury. Um, and six patients withdrew from treatment, a seventh met criteria for withdrawal, but was discontinued for non-compliance during this trial. And importantly, all of these elevations in transaminases did resolve. So based on the randomized controlled trials in Dravet syndrome and LGS, uh, this led to the FDA approval on June 25th of 2018 with epidiolex is indicated for the treatment of seizures associated with lennox gastaut syndrome or Dravet syndrome in patients two years of age or older. Importantly, this was the first FDA approved drug containing a purified drug substance from marijuana. It was also the F first FDA approval of a drug um, specific for Dravet syndrome in the United States. Following this, the DEA rescheduled um, cannabidiol to class five, uh, and it was subsequently descheduled. And as you know, also um, epidiolysis has now been approved in Europe by the EMA uh, in, with these indications in conjunction um, with clobazam therapy. Then turning to the uh, TSC trial, which I was wicked excited about given my longstanding passion um, and interest in tuberous sclerosis complex. Um, I think as everyone knows, TSC is a multi-system genetic disorder thought to affect approximately one in 6,000 individuals uh, due to a mutation in the TSC1 or TSC2 gene. Uh, and epilepsy is really the most common symptom in TSC with 85% of individuals developing epilepsy at some point in their life, 70% the onset of first year of life. And we also know that about two thirds of individuals with TS will develop refractory epilepsy compared to the one third in the general epilepsy population. So a significant unmet need for effective therapies for epilepsy in TSC. So this trial enrolled 244 TSC patients ages one to 65 uh, with treatment resistant epilepsy. Uh, eligibility um, criteria included having eight seizures during a four week baseline. And patients that enrolled in this trial were then randomized to three arms, placebo, 
low dose 25 milligram per kilogram per day or high dose 50 milligram per kilogram per day. And note that these doses are higher than the prior trials. And importantly also in this trial, approximately 25% of the, those enrolled were in that adult population. So again, gaining experience, not only of the hospital efficacy of CBD and pediatric epilepsy, but also adult refractory epilepsy. And the trial design of this was also very similar with a four week titration and then 12 week maintenance. Primary endpoint of this trial was a percent change from baseline in the number of TSC associated seizures. This just shows the trial design of the screening, then the baseline, the titration, and then the maintenance period. As with the other trials at the end of this, all, of the, all those who completed the treatment arm were uh, given the option to enroll in the open label extension. Uh, so I won't present this data today, but from the OLE, both from the Dervais, LGS, and from the TSC trial, we are getting more information, or we now have more information about safety, tolerability, uh, and maintained efficacy of this treatment. And this shows the primary endpoint, uh, which was met the change in number of TSC associated seizures. And as you can see, both the 25 and 50 milligram per kilogram arms um, had a statistically significant greater median reduction in seizures than the placebo arm. The AEDs also occurred in this, uh, and those were again, the most common diarrhea, vomiting, constipation. Uh, and again, elevations in liver transaminases were seen. Again, the majority of those on concomitant valproic acid. And this trial led to the um, FDA approval in July of 2020 of purified cannabidiol for the treatment of seizures associated with tuber sclerosis complex in patients um, of one year of age and older. And importantly, this showed the efficacy of CBD in focal seizures. Uh, the question I frequently got uh, when I talked to my colleagues about this, well, yeah, it's good in Dervais and it's good in LGS, but is it good in focal seizures? So I think that this showed not only is um, it effective in patients with TSC, but likely those with focal seizures of other etiologies. Um, it also lowered the FDA approval of CBD uh, in the United States to patients one year and older. And I think May, as many of you may also know, uh, this also was recently approved by the EMA, uh, uh, again, for the treatment of seizures associated uh, with TSC with concomitant clobazam. So kind of going back to where we started with this, again, eight years ago when we met in a, in a seminar room in New York without windows talking about our need to really show and learn if this was a good treatment for our patients and a safe and well tolerated. Um, so we went back to look at kind of at the time of the FDA approval for um, CBD, where were our patients that had enrolled in the expanded access program? So at that time, 20 had left. The most common reason for leaving was lack of efficacy, uh, but also three left to try CBD and THC combinations. Again, many people very interested in that entourage effect and could that be more effective? Um, three also left to enroll in other clinical trials as even though they may have had some efficacy with CBD, it wasn't desired efficacy and wanted the opportunity to try other treatment options. At the most recent visit, when we looked at this data cut, uh, median at that time, had, the individuals had been on CBD for 45.5 months with a range of 34 to 60. Um, we saw that main efficacy had been maintained. Uh, so 23 out of 33, or almost 70% of those individuals continued to have a greater than 50% reduction in seizures, including seven or 21% who had a greater than 90% reduction in seizures. We also looked at dose range and what we have seen is like many of our medications, I believe there's a very broad dose range of CBD that can be effective. And in our population of those in the EAP, the mean dose was 32 0.2 mg per kg per day, so higher than what the current FDA approved um, dosage is. We also saw that most of these patients had had no change in the number of concomitant medications, um, although there were more on fewer number or on lower doses. And I think a lot of it has that these patients were really, really refractory. Um, and as we said, had been on numerous other medications and treatment um, modalities. And I think both I, uh, as well as the families, were very hesitant to rock the boat and to take their medications off. But we have slowly over the years, these kids have been on this uh, and had maintained seizure control, been lowering and de decreasing medications. 
So when should CBD be used then for the treatment of medically refractory epilepsy? I think the trial data um, has shown that CBD, uh, at least in particular this formulation of CBD, and I think it's really important to stress that. We don't know anything about efficacy. There's been no trials with the other formulations of cannabidiol other than the form that is now FDA and EMA approved, but it's been shown to be effective safe and fairly well tolerated in Dravet syndrome, lenis gastos syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis complex. And the expanded access program, which enrolled patients with epilepsy from all different, of all different types and from all different etiologies, would suggest that there is broad range efficacy um, in different epilepsies. And there have been some publications looking at this um, from this experience in CDKL5, ACARDI, um, DUP15, et cetera. Also with the experience we have with this medication now, the drug-drug interactions have been fairly well characterized and proving safety and tolerability. Uh, I think many of us would argue that we still have more to understand and learn about drug-drug interactions, but we've learned, and importantly, that CBD and clobazan, there's a significant interaction, uh, which can lead to increased levels of desmethyl clobazam, the main metabolite, which can lead to sedation and agitation. This interaction probably is beneficial to many patients as well. Um, because CBD and clobazam each affect each other's metabolism. So CBD does not affect the uh, initial metabolism of clobazam, the parent drug, but does inhibit the, the, um, the further metabolism of desmethylclobazam. And desmethylclobazam also has anti-seizure activity. Clobazam affects the metabolism of CBD by increasing the levels of one of its main metabolites, 7-hydroxy-CBD, which also has anti-seizure property. So in a way, getting four anti-seizure um, treatments for two. Uh, and I, I do believe that many of, our fam many of our patients do benefit from this combination. Then we also know there is some interaction that's not well understood between CBD and valproate uh, that leads to an elevation of liver function enzymes, um, which led to the recommendation of, by the FDA to do baseline as well as follow up um, transaminase testing when starting. Um, CBD, either with concomitant valproate or not in the presence of valproate, since not every patient in the trial who had an elevation was on valproate. And then importantly for those with in the tuberous sclerosis community, many of whom are on mTOR inhibitors, uh, CBD inhibits um, the metabolism of everolimus, which can lead to significant elevations of everolimus levels. Again, very important to understand and recognize that uh, for safety reasons. So, and when should it be used? So we know it can work, uh, but when should it be used? Uh, so what I've learned through the past seven years with uh, this formulation of CBD is it's not a silver bullet. And I think that's a very important message as well, because as there was a lot of hype in the United States and elsewhere, uh, that this could be, that CBD could be the cure for epilepsy. Um, very important to know, it does not work for everyone, but I do think it's an <clears throat> important addition to our toolbox, um, what options we have to treat our patients with epilepsy. The other are the cost and payer coverage key variables in the United States. It's about estimated $32,000 per year for an average adult. <laughs> And therefore, I think with the limited experience and also the cost and payer coverage, I don't think many of us consider CBD yet a first line therapy, uh, but it may become so with increasing clinical experience regarding efficacy, safety, and tolerability. And big question, really big question, what is the role of CBD in other disorders? And as you know, there is a lot of interest uh, in other epilepsies, there's ongoing trials in Rett syndrome, a uh, lot of interest and in possible benefit of CBD and autism. Um, we often think, you know, we did see anecdotally or subject, subjectively improvements cognitively, behaviorally uh, in many of our kids who are on this treatment, but there's really limited data on any of these things. So as I said, this has really been a big focus of my group um, over the past eight years and started this with the EAP. It was Tricia Bruno, my epilepsy nurse coordinator, me um, kind of enrolling these kids, starting these kids. And as the EAP grew, the trials grew, you can see that my team became a village or a town. Uh, and I also have a great deal of gratitude to the folks in the research pharmacy. I'm working with an initially the, what was a schedule one medication in the United States, plus several layers of complexity uh, and hoops to jump to do that. And they really um, were really dedicated to this project because they also felt it was very important to see if there's an effective therapy um, for people living with epilepsy. And then 
kind of this whole story started with an anecdote, the anecdotes of patients benefiting from medical marijuana. Uh, and I of, often also tell medical students and residents that we do not practice medicine based on anecdotes, but I think it's very important to take a step back and try to figure out what those anecdotes are trying to teach us. And so I'll finish with an anecdote. Um, one of the kids that did enroll in our expanded access program had myoclonic astatic epilepsy. Uh, and she had been on every treatment option. She'd been on the ketogenic diet. She'd had the vagus nerve, has the vagus, had the vagus nerve stimulator, uh, yet she continued to have 20, 40 seizures a day. And around the same time she enrolled in the EAP, her family also got a $17,000 seizure dog who's shown here named Ryder. Uh, and they kind of chronicled her journey with CBD experience by sending me pictures of Ryder. Uh, and this is Ryder uh, one year after this patient had been seizure free after initially starting and Ryder's retirement party. Um, this child, young woman has continued to be seizure free and has now been seizure free for over seven years. Uh, and last year graduated from high school, which we would have never thought possible prior to attaining seizure, uh, seizure control. Um, so with that uh, anecdotal story and a picture of a cute now retired $17,000 seizure dog um, I'd like to thank you guys very, very much for your time and for uh, asking me to come and talk with you about CBD. So thank you very much. Thank you, actually. It was a great talk and a very, very um, thought provoking. And um, so we have had uh, several questions that uh, the panels and uh, the, the attendees have posted. So I'm gonna start with in order of appearance. Um, some may have been already answered. Um, so if that is the case, I may not read them. Um, and some questions I don't really understand. Uh, so for instance, uh, can we start ketogenic diet or other uh, dietary uh, modifications early in the course of treatment? Um, and I, I'm assuming with the CBD oil, I, I'm a, because no, no more details. So, what? Um, so I am a zealot about dietary therapy, and we use both ketogenic diet as well as low glycemic index treatment. Um, very frequently, uh, we have hundreds of patients on these diets. And yes, we use them early, you know, forget CBD, we do use them early. Um, we have used low glycemic first line therapy in Angelman kids and some other family for some other patients who are very kind of don't like medications or the concept of medications. If you talk about dietary therapy and CBD, yes, we have many, many patients on it. And actually the, um, the formulation that's FDA approved is keto compatible. Um, there are not significant carbohydrates in it. And also what we know about CBD is fat um, increases the absorption. So yes. if, if you're on a low fat versus a high fat diet, it's about five times better absorption of CBD. So I think it's probably a really good combination to be on dietary mm -hmm. therapy and CBD. And do you still use the same doses or do you go lower on the doses of CBD? Uh, we have used the same doses, but that's a really good question because you know we titrate kind of to efficacy. And mm -hmm. I haven't gone back to say, is there are kids on the diet who are doing better on the lower doses? Uh, and right now CBD um, levels are not clinically available, but yeah. that's a really good question. When, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, Dr. Venkata from um, Pasupala, I believe is the last name, uh, ask if there are any predictors for TS for patient with TSC that could be responders to CBD. Have you found any? So that's another good question. I have not, but that's also not something that I have really looked at. Mm -hmm. um, but we see that people with TSC1 and TSC2 mutations respond. We see people with all types of seizures respond. Um, but from our expanded access program, we had published a prior report of 18 patients um, with TS uh, who 50% of them were responders. Again, very, very highly refractory patients um, with TSC. And we looked at seizure types. And what I was impressed by was that some of those patients, as well as a couple other patients in our AAP had epileptic spasms, which as you know, are really tough to treat. Yeah. Um, and all of them responded. Now, interestingly, they were in combination therapy with clobazam. Uh, and when GW then subsequently went and did a small trial in, in, in infantile spasms, that was not positive, but clobazam was an exclusion criteria for that. So I'm, I'm wondering if maybe that, that combination that can be beneficial um, may be really beneficial for spasms, epileptic spasms. But we saw, in TS, we saw it work across the seizure types. 
um, but I haven't done a more detailed analysis. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, so Dr. Shelley Wise from Sick uh, Kids in Toronto, uh, thanks, thanks you for an excellent talk. And, and she's wondering if there is a maximum dose for an adult uh, patient or would you give 50 milligram per kilo to 60 milligram per kilo? Um, she's wondering. So what I have learned about this, and I think it's an important thing, is that there is a really broad dose range. Uh, and, you know, the initial FDA and EMA approval was up to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day for Dravet and, and uh, LGS. The TS trial used the higher doses. It used the doses that we were using the expanded access program. And what we saw was there really wasn't, not that you could really combine all the data from all the trials, but there really didn't appear to be a dose response curve that more is definitely better. Uh, mm -hmm. And in the TS trial, you kind of saw the efficacy between the, that low 25 and 50 were pretty similar. Tolerability was more difficult in a higher dose, as would be expected, mm -hmm. um, but it did show safe passage. Um, and we know with many of our medications, ranging from levetiracetam to lamotrigine to clobazam, some people do better on lower doses and some people need the higher doses. So kind of what we learned from the TS trial is we have safe passage that if patients do need to go up to that higher, um, higher dose, that they can achieve better efficacy and they can achieve, you know, maintain tolerability. I was kind of surprised when we looked recently at our EAP data that the median dose was 32 megs. I might have guessed it would have been a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. um, what we do see with adults is we dose them the same. And you know, I think that's been a change for our, my adult colleagues is getting used to weight-based dosing for a seizure med. Um, but the issue that can become is tolerability. Uh, it, since it is in an oil formulation, the higher doses, it's a higher volume and that leads to higher incidence of diarrhea. Um, for many of our you know, kind of the Dre kids, LGS kids, the families view that as a positive side effect because constipation is so common in that population, but mm -hmm. that can be limiting for the, for the dose is that risk of diarrhea. And, you know, mm -hmm. so there's been a lot of interest also in other formulations of CBD other than the sesame seed oil. Mm -hmm. It's also true. I think that CBD itself is a very mild laxative uh, because if you look in the trials, the incidence of diarrhea was greater in the treatment arm than the placebo arm. So it's probably the oil plus a little contribution of the CBD being a mild laxative. I see. Yeah, maybe the receptors working in the um, intestines as well. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Diana Dragon um, is wondering if, um, have you have any experience with other epilepsy syndromes like uh, Duce or Duza syndrome in adults? Uh, particularly. So um, any thoughts? I don't know if I have any adults with DUSA. I, in our expanded access program, we had several adolescents like the young woman. I kind of told you the anecdotal story about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the expanded access program did enroll lots of different etiologies and types of epilepsy, including kids with less encephaly, uh, you know, kids who had had perinatal strokes, kids with other genetic epilepsies. So in my mind, it's gonna be pretty broadly efficacious. And I think a lot of us would guess that if something worked well in LGS and if something worked well in, in Dravet syndrome with um, that it could have more broader efficacy because uh, there's nothing to suggest by the proposed mechanisms of action that it would be specifically effective in any of those with the exception of if it really could modulate mTOR, would that give it some additional benefit in TSC? Mm -hmm. Um, so Dr. Germain van Rickel Borsel, sorry, uh, I apologize for the pronunciation, um, um, had an experience with um, a patient that was for years on valproic acid and added CBD and developed pancreatitis uh, a few weeks after. So he's wondering if it is something that you have experienced in your practice and it's something common. Sorry. So I have not seen pancreatitis. Um, but clearly in the trials, the, it's elevation in LFTs. And again, those were kids who had been on Valproate tolerating it well, add in CBD and go, up, go to the LFTs. We don't understand what leads to that. And I would assume it might be a similar mechanism to what led to your patient to develop pancreatitis. Um, the only thing we can measure is free Valproate. Um, and we tried measuring that clinically and there was no change. Wondering if it was like a protein some interaction or protein binding, mm -hmm. don't know. But I think that 
it's an opportunity since the since the hepatotoxicity of valproate's never been well understood. I'm proposing, hey, now we have a chance. You know, if CBD interacts with valproate this way, if we understand that, maybe we can understand the hepatotoxicity of valproate. Um, but that's what I would. So I, I am cautious. You know, if, if we do have kids on valproate and we add it to we add in CBD, we do follow them a little bit more closely, and then we follow kids who are not on concomitant valproate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's something that we always are worried about here too. Um, here in Canada, we don't have access to Epidiolex. Uh, we do have access to combination of CBD and THC. Um, so we use a wide range of anywhere between 10 to 1, 20 to 1, to 100 to 1. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Paula Marquez and Chantel um, Brasildil. Uh, have wondered about um, if you have any experience with uh, CBD and THC, which probably, um, well, you, you can answer. And then if you did, um, have you used similar doses of CBD um, when combining with THC? Um, very good questions. So yes, prior to the availability of Epidiolex, I had many, 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 many patients on different formulations of medical marijuana and all those extracts. Um, the problem with those are is, and I've gained a lot of respect for the cannabis plant. I'm a little obsessed with the plant now um, because mm -hmm. in addition to being very complicated with those 500, greater than 500 chemicals, it's also extremely fickle. Mm -hmm. And if you change the temperature, change the humidity, change the length of the day, change the soil, the composition of the plant changes dramatically. So mm -hmm. even if I was growing my own cannabis to extract it for myself or my child, the composition of each extract would be very different. So I think it's hard to say if my patients are taking those different formulations, I'm not really sure what they're getting. Uh, and then the FDA also over the years has gone and, get, and gotten some of those and tested them and seen that what they say they are is not really what they are. Some of them not even containing cannabidiol, cannabidiol although claiming to be. So in the United States, we haven't had a consistent enough availability of products to, for me to be able to say. Um, there are a lot of people who think that entourage effect of a little THC, THCA may be beneficial. And a couple of our people who left the EAP did so for that. Uh, one of these families spent two years trying different combinations of CBD, THC, THCA, and came back to us wanting to go back on epidiolex. And mm -hmm. I felt badly for those families because they really did feel like they were experimenting with their own children. I couldn't give them recommendations. We didn't know um, they were trying it. The other thing, if you look at the animal model of THC, there's conflicting evidence because some of the animal models, THC is actually pro-convulsant. Mm -hmm. And I do have one of my patients who prior to epidiolex availability was using medical marijuana and it varied batch to batch. Um, which is actually what led to the involvement of GW was a child in California uh, using medical marijuana and batch to batch um, variability, um, which led the family to try and connect with GW to say, hey, you have a purified version. You know, could we try that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, along those lines, um, the, there, there have been few questions regarding the efficacy of CBD and um, not efficacy of CBD, the impact and the effect of CBD in cognition um, and also THC, if you have experience with that. Too. So CBD, I think that it can, you know, we, we, when we did our EAP, we actually did it with um, neuropsych kind of before the kids started. And then after they titrated up and we're on 25 megs per kg per day. Unfortunately, what we didn't know when we had this brilliant plan was we didn't understand yet the significant interaction of clobazam and CBD. And since we tried to maintain medications the same, a lot of these kids, by the time they had that follow-up neuropsych, were really whomped because mm -hmm. of that. Um, but we had did get a lot of subjective comments from families. Um, and and the, one of my favorite, actually, is one of my TS kids who is Lenis Gusto. She's nonverbal, um, autistic. Uh, her, her mother used the term that um, improved cognitive availability, which I thought was a really nice description. And that they noticed that before she became a responder. Um, so if you get improved seizure control on any treatment and kids look brighter and do cognitively better, is it because you made their seizures better? Is there a separate effect of the medication? There was enough little hints of that is kind of, and also changes in behavior, which is what's really generated a lot of this interest of CBD and autism. And I'm very interested in that because I did, even my kids, if you look at our expanded access program, some of them that have been on it for up to 50 months, 
they didn't have a significant reduction in the seizures, but there was perceived benefit by the parents and honestly by me to continue it. Um, we've had kids that have had dramatic changes in their ed plans in school because of improvements, et cetera. So I, I think there's a lot more we need to know about what is the impact of CBD on cognition and behavior. With regard to THC, I don't have any experience no, um, no. with that. I imagine. Thank you. Yeah, also the, the long-term effect, right? Because we're really short-term um, experience, right? right? Um, I think um, we have gone over all the questions we had here. Um, Rajesh, do you have any question for Dr. Phil? Uh, no, thank you so much, Dr. Philip. Um, I really appreciate that. And I know that you are coming back to Canada online January to present at our McMaster uh, Grand Rounds as well. Great. So um, I think we're almost on time. So everybody's obviously saying thank you very much, great talk, congratulations, and 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 all all <laughs> all things. So I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your knowledge, sharing so so uh, wisely and. And, and making the time to, to be with us this morning, noonish or afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. It was great. And thank you for inviting me. I think especially during COVID, even though we can't see each other, I think it's very important to stay connected academically. So I really appreciated the opportunity to join you guys. Thank you very much. Have thank a lovely you. day. Take Everyone care. have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.